So today we are very honored to have with us Jeremy, partner and head of technology and communications at Bird and Bird, and Anand, partner in the intellectual property practice at Bird and Bird, to share with us some new ideas and strategies that we can look to to navigate this space. Also together with them, we have Jeffrey Ong, Regional Director at Michael Peach, who will be talking about the talent in the AI space and some trends that are shaping the legal market in Singapore today. So without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist, Jeremy. Jeremy is the Head of Technology and Communications Practice at Bird and Bird and a partner in the commercial team. He has extensive experience advising across a broad range of clients across APEC and has particular expertise in advising on multi-jurisdictional legal, regulatory and commercial issues arising in the digital space, such as payments, IoT, AI, distributed ledger, technology, cybersecurity, cloud computing and digital transformation. He's also known to be able to provide practical and quick advice to multi complex multi-jurisdictional issues. So Jeremy will be speaking on AI and data privacy issues. Over to you, Jeremy. Great. Uh, hi. Um, hi, everyone. And um, first, first of all, thank you very much, Michael Page, for giving us this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, and I think, I think this topic on AI and data privacy is very topical because it's something that we, are, we, we hear bandied very often, AI, AI, everything is, has a form of artificial intelligence in it. Um, and I think it's important for us to understand how, how AI works, um, what, what's powering AI, and what are the legal issues that we should be aware of from a data protection perspective. So first of all, um, I'd just like to start off with this slide. And uh, I find this slide quite useful, partly because I'm a transactional lawyer. And for me, every contract starts off with a definition. So I think it's really important for us to understand and define what we're talking about. Um, and, and this is an issue that we often face when speaking with clients about artificial intelligence. Everyone seems to have a slightly different perspective on artificial intelligence. And, and that, that, that is not necessarily wrong. Um, it's really because artificial intelligence spans a spectrum. On one end, we have very simple automation like robotic process automation, which is essentially a sophisticated logic tree. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have full autonomy where uh, we're, we're talking about self-driving cars, um, automa automated decision making across a whole um, spectrum of factors. Uh, we also have narrow AI, or narrow AI, which is AI that's been trained to look at particular aspects of, of, of our lives or of our job processes. Like, like in this picture here, we're looking at buildings or people. Um, and then we also have general AI that's capable of lateral broad thinking. Um, and excuse me for including a picture of a robot here because I, I, I've been on numerous AI um, presentations and I think that I've not been on one where that doesn't feature a robot. So I think it, it, it's almost like the norm to have a robot in an AI presentation. Um, but I think that illustrates the sort of spectrum that we are talking about. And, and so if we really try to put a, a definition on artificial intelligence, um, it, you know, it's really things like cognitive computing, computer vision, machine learning, uh, deep learning, and, and it's an open question mark because technology will be changing. And I think it's, it's important on, as us as lawyers to really understand what is happening in the space, what, how the technology evolves, because only when we understand it, then we can, advise our clients or our business on what are the legal issues around the use of this technology. But I think the, the, the main important point about AI is really that it is essentially powered by data. And we're talking about personal data and non-personal data. And, and, and there's a saying in the use of uh, AI or in the use of computing is that it's basically garbage in, garbage out. So your, your artificial intelligence and your program is only as good as the data that you're feeding it. Um, and while there are a whole host of issues relating to the use of non-personal data, um, for example, in recent times, we've seen India launch a consultation paper on regulating non-personal data. Uh, we see some aspects of non-personal data being regulated in China and in, in the EU as well. But for, for today's purposes, we'll really be focusing on the personal data aspects of data which powers artificial intelligence. 
And, and so on that note, I just thought it'd be useful to summarize the general privacy principles that underpin most data protection laws. And I think some of you on this call um, already have some familiarity with personal data or data privacy principles. And, and we can take this conversation one step higher in the, in, in the panel discussion, but for the rest of, of us who are coming to this green, then I think it's really important to get a good understanding of what these privacy principles are. And, and a big caveat here, um, uh, because that's what lawyers do, we caveat. Um, I think whilst these are the main privacy principles that span most data protection laws, I think you'll, start, you'll see that there are variations of that across different jurisdictions. And we'll come to that in a little bit. So privacy principles, firstly, it's legal basis. And this is the basis on which you are collecting, processing, and using the data. Uh, purpose, making sure that you are, um, you are limiting the use of the data for a particular purpose, notification, or transparency making sure that you're transparent and notifying data subjects on the purpose um, of, for which you're collecting and processing the data, accuracy, uh, making sure that the data is accurate, Re retention, making sure that you don't keep it for longer than you need to, and then being mindful of data subject rights and also mindful of security, uh, which is something very important when you're using um, personal data for AI because you need volumes of data. And if you're collecting volumes of data, then you need to make sure that that that, that data that you collect is secure as well. And then there are also principles around offshore transfer. So earlier on, I alluded to regional or jurisdictional variances in privacy laws. And this slide shows um, a, a color coded map or a snapshot of the privacy regimes across Asia Pacific. And you see that countries with red are those with an omnibus privacy law, like in Singapore, where we have the PDPA. Um, countries with blue are those with other privacy laws, which are not, which are, um, are laws that deal with private data privacy and data protection, but not necessarily private privacy laws per se. So these could be cyber security laws or national security laws. Um, and then the countries in green are those with uh, upcoming bills or amendments. So I, I, I think this slide is really important because it illustrates that for most of us operating in Singapore, we, we look after a region and it's really important to understand that there are regional variations or regional differences um, to data privacy, especially when we're using it in the context of artificial intelligence or as part of a digital transformation program. So drilling a little deeper into this, this diversity of privacy laws in the region, you start to see that there are actually different approaches. Um, to so in the earlier slide, we talked about the legal basis for processing as one of the principles. And here on this slide, you can see already that there is a, there is a divergence in the, in the approach to um, processing requirements. So in countries like in, um, in green, it's largely based on consent. And then if we're looking at it in the blue, it's based on other, other, other bases such as legitimate interests. And I think if we drill down into the main requirements for um, artificial intelligence from a data protection perspective, we're looking at consent because consent is really important when you're trying to collect the data. And you see on this slide, what I've done is I've tried to juxtapose the regional flavor of um, data privacy laws against the GDPR. And, and I'm sure everyone would be familiar with the GDPR because in, in, in May 2018, you would have been spammed by everyone about the GDPR coming into force and probably continue to be spanned by the GDPR, by GDPR related uh, updates as well. So the GDPR is the European data protection regulations and it's, it's increasingly becoming seen as the world or, or the international standard for data privacy. So on, that, on, on the left side in black, you'll see that there's the GDPR standard, which, is, which talks about concern being informed, freely given, specific, active and unambiguous. And on the right, you. I've color coded the different requirements across the region, uh, green being a, a, a more relaxed uh, position to the GDPR, um, orange being probably equivalent and red being more onerous than the GDPR. And you can see again that there, is, there are quite a lot of variations across these jurisdictions. Um, the same for data processing and transfer agreements as well. There is the GDPR standard and also then we start to see regional um, regional or even jurisdiction specific uh, nuances to these requirements. And again, for data subject rights, 
we have a whole host of rights under the GDPR, right to access, right to rectification, erasure, restriction of processing, data portability, the right to object, um, automated decision making. And then on the, on the right of the screen, you start to see that there are actually variations of the data subject rights. So all of these means that, that, that looking at data protection and looking at data privacy um, from an AI perspective becomes a little bit more complicated because we, we need to make sure that the data that we're collecting you know, is, is in keeping with those requirements, but we also need to make sure that it is, um, it is, it is of sufficient diversity to allow us to power and, and weed out all the errors in the, in the, um, in the AI program. And I think on this slide, it's really just a practical checklist on what you should be thinking about when you're trying to use personal data in an, in an artificial intelligence context. And I think um, the most important thing to remember is that you need to make sure that there is valid notice and consent and that you're using the data for that limited purpose. I think, I think it, if possible, um, you should always strive to anonymize the data because then that takes the data out of the, out of the personal data or data privacy regime and putting it into the realm of non-personal data. And I think lastly, I, I would always emphasize that a good check on, on, on when it comes to data privacy is how would you feel if it was your personal data? I think that's a very important sort of uh, human touch point uh, to bring into the equation when you're looking at data privacy issues in AI or in digital transformation. So I'm just gonna round this off by saying that this is an evolving space. We need to be, we, need, we as lawyers need to stay abreast of the law to see what's happening in this space. Um, there are going to be changes to the PDPA in Singapore. We've already had the first reading of the uh, bill in parliament. Um, one of, in, in, um, in respects of artificial intelligence, I think you see that there is now the right, uh, the proposed right to use data without consent for business innovation. And that, that is sort of moving us into um, the ability to use personal data for AI. Um, we've, also start, we've also seen guidelines issued by the MAS, by the PDPC on the use of artificial intelligence. And also because there aren't overarching AI laws, we're starting to see private companies um, come up with ethical guidelines and frameworks on the use of artificial intelligence. So I think whilst personal data and data privacy rules are important, it's also important to keep an eye out on all these other principles and guidelines that will also impact the way the law evolves in this space. So that's my primer on personal data and the use of artificial intelligence. So I'm gonna pause here and hand, hand the floor over to Anand now. Um, we'll talk about intellectual property in digital transformation. I'll be very happy to pick up any questions or discussions um, during the panel session. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for that very insightful sharing and, of course, putting all these complex issues to us in very simple terms. I think data privacy is a developing topic, especially in Asia Pacific. And um, like uh, he mentioned, I think the audience will have many burning questions. So please um, submit the questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer every question at the end of the session. So next up, as uh, Jeremy has also introduced, we've got Anand, who will share with us on intellectual property strategies in digital transformation. So before I introduce Anand, he actually has a question for all of you. Sophia, could you bring up the poll, please? Okay, so um, his question is, how familiar are you with IP? Number one, very familiar. Two, somewhat familiar. I know some things about patents and trademarks. Three, not really familiar. I think I'm supposed to be careful when I see the C or the R in the circle kind of symbol. And four, IP, the Donnie Yen movies, IP Man 1 to 4. So we'll keep the polls open for the next 20 to 30 seconds um, for the participants to vote while I give a quick introduction on Anand. So Anand is a partner in Bird & Bird's intellectual property group in Singapore and has extensive experience in patent litigation, management and monetization, trademark litigation and other high value IP matters. He has international experience having handled major patent lawsuits in Singapore, US and Europe and also trademark disputes globally. Prior to Bird & Bird, he was also in a senior in-house role um, in a technology company where he oversaw their global legal matters with a focus on IP, 
including monetization of the patent company's patent portfolio. So I think the poll results are, are out, so I'll just hand this time over to Anand. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very disappointed that nobody took up my Ipman challenge. Um, so the reason I wanted the poll is so it would help me to decide how quickly I move through my slides. Um, in some ways, there are two parts to the slides, the, the basic part, which is more at the beginning. And then I also have the you know, slightly more detailed part towards the end. Uh, next slide, please. So for today's session, I, I came up with these topics. Uh, I'm going to cover the first two together. So I put their IP audit, taking stock of your IP, your registered and unregistered patents and so on. Uh, and then secondly, reviewing your current and future products and services. Do you have adequate protection? And then I'll round things off uh, just to touch on a good example of IP infringement in the current era that we live in, the, the digital era, um, you know, with, with online sale issues and then working with platforms and government bodies. So how you can um, steer through this, this new minefield that we're all facing today. Next slide, please. So just like Jeremy started off asking a question and having the definition at the beginning, this is, this is mine. So what is intellectual property? Um, and so you've got the whole you know, range of things listed out there. Of course, the most important uh, football team in the world needs to have their trademark registered, as you all will know, of course. Uh, and then you've got the Coke bottle, which is a registered design and, and a few other things. So these are the kinds of things based on the poll results, I guess most of you will be familiar with. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this is a good case study for all of you because if you're working in the tech space or any space, frankly, you will see from this slide that for that one product in the middle there, you've got the iPhone, there is a whole range of IP that can be uh, protected. So, you know, you've got trademarks, which most of you, I guess, will be familiar with. You know, you've got the iPhone uh, logos, even Hey Siri and so on. And then you've got copyright. So you've got, you can see the iOS, uh, whatever it's 10, 12, 14 now, I think. Uh, so things like that are protected by copyright. You've got registered design. So the shape um, of the phones are protected by registered designs. And in fact, there have been many fights in quite a few countries between Apple and Samsung in the past over registered designs actually. Uh, and then patents. So for the iPhone uh, versions 8 and 10, just by way of example, you can see the kinds of patents that uh, Apple have got protection for, you know, city sounding things, basic stuff. But, you know, at the time they file the applications, they tend to make sure that it's not out there. That's the whole idea, right? Um, and so, uh, Apple have you know filed countless number of patents covering each one of their phones and their tablets and so on and so forth. Uh, and I've added in something on trade secrets. So that's something that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, you know there is a trade-off. So patents, if you want patent protection, you'll get it for X number of years. Uh, trade secrets um, are things that you don't disclose. And so if you are prepared to disclose things, you get your patent and you get 20 years worth of protection. If you're not prepared to disclose something, then you've got to keep it as a trade secret. And I'll just shed more light on that later on. But of course, there is a danger, as you see from the little clippings there, uh, you know, some people are targeting your trade secrets. So you've got to make sure you, you protect them well. Next slide, please. So just some useful information. Most of you already know this. We've got iPods, we've got the different acts covering the, the relevant uh, uh, IPs that we have here in Singapore. If you do medical devices and things like that, there is the Health Products Act as well that may be relevant to you. Next slide, please. So this uh, slide just talks simply about trademarks. Uh, most of you will know this already, identifies your sorts of goods, protects goodwill. Um, uh, one thing that's important in the second box there is 10-year protection is what you get at the beginning, but you can, in the case we can get, you know, indefinite uh, term of protection uh, subject to using the mark and not being cancelled by somebody who's not happy and so on and so forth. Uh, one thing that you should note, and you probably already know this already, is uh, 
your rights are territorial. So if you want to trademark in Singapore, you found in Singapore, you want it elsewhere, you have to file separate applications there too. Next slide, please. So copyright is a little more complicated for Singapore because we do not have registration of copyright. Um, the thing that you need to note in the middle there is copyright protection is 70 years, uh, life by 70 years. Um, now, you know, copyright, again, you may have some rough understanding. So, you know, if, you, if you're writing a song, if you're writing a book, uh, software, these things are all generally um, uh, protectable by copyright. Uh, you just need to make sure, and again, in the middle there, I, I put in preservation of evidence of creation is very important. So, if there's a dispute, if you're accusing somebody of copyright infringement, you need to make sure that the records that you keep are, are good. They need to be dated. Um, you know, if you are going to publish things you know, on your website, make sure you put a copyright statement, you know, a little C at very least, so that people will uh, know that this is something you are claiming, you know, is yours and there is copyright protection. Uh, and in Singapore, there's a fair bit of copyright infringement actions going on now, mostly with software providers, uh, because a lot of people are downloading software left, right and centre, um, as is the world we live in today and they are then being sued by a lot of the software owners. Next slide, please. Patents, uh, something most of you, again, will be familiar with. Um, basic information there on inventions and what have you. Uh, time is 20 years from the application date. And again, this one I have to emphasize, the territorial nature of patents, because a lot of people assume you file a patent in one country, it's protected uh, all over the world. That's not the case. So your patents need to be filed in each and every country. You need to get your protection. Uh, if you are manufacturing in a country, you might want to make sure that your patent is protected there because that's quite key for you. Um, next slide, please. Then we have registered designs. Uh, you saw the pictures of the, the phone earlier. So this protects the visual appearance of articles, yeah, the shape configuration and so on. It does not protect functional features. So that's something you need to bear in mind. Uh, it's fairly easy to get your, your designs registered here in Singapore, fairly quick process, uh, and you will get protection for a maximum of 15 years. Next slide, please. So I finish off this section uh, talking on trade secrets. So um, you need to, to go through you know, certain steps to make sure that when you are trying to keep something as a trade secret, um, you keep it secret, meaning it's really to a very limited number of people within your organization who has access to this information. It's not something you just send in a memo to the, you know, the whole company and say, okay, guys, keep this secret. That, and please be, it's not gonna be a trade secret. So it needs to be really something that's treated, um, you know, like in the army, you have top secret, right? Similarly for your companies, that's how, um, you know, trade secrets are kept and maintained. Uh, the world's most, well, the most commonly referred to trade secret today is the Coca-Cola recipe. It's going strong, I think it's like over 100 years now. <clears throat> and you know, it's, it's survived all this time. So that's something that you need to think about because some companies just do not want to publish information for the world to, to see. And so if you've got something brilliant that you need protection, you can keep it as a trade secret and just make sure it's kept within you know, a very tiny group within your, your company. Um, next slide, please. So Singapore is a great place to register IP. I mean, you know, for those of you who, who live here, you know that IPOS and, and, and the relevant ministries are very aggressive in making sure that um, uh, there are lots of incentives, a lot of help given to, to you know, small medium companies as well as big ones uh, to register your IP here. And we are signatories to lots of conventions and treaties and the Convention, PCT. Uh, and then we've got the ASEAN Patent and Examination Cooperation. So there's a lot of fast tracking that's going on, uh, the Patent Prosecution Highway. Uh, one thing that I haven't updated on my slides here is uh, the SGIP fast track. So that was, uh, that was pushed out last month. And in that fast track, there are ways that you can really speed up the filing of your IP here in Singapore. Um, like for example, patents, can be uh, processed within six months. And that's the promise that IPOS has given. Uh, trademarks as quickly as three months and registered designs as quickly as one month. 
Uh, I think there, there's some caveats, lawyers being lawyers. Uh, I think for patents, there's a maximum of five. The first five in for a particular month, uh, IPOS will undertake to try and, and speed that up and get you get the first five in the door for that month to, to get your fast granted patents uh, and so on and so forth. And then I think for one year, the, there's a maximum of 10 patents that any company can can use this fast track process. So, I mean, it's a great place to file your IP and get it uh, protected quickly. And that can also be used as a springboard for other filings around the world. Because, you know, you can use the Singapore filing date as a priority date and so on. Uh, why do I talk about all this? I guess at the end of the day, when we're looking at your due diligence, that's something you guys need to pause. So if you're, if you're a GC or IP counsel or you know, regular counsel in a company, and new products are being rolled out and new software is being rolled out, these are things that you guys need to help the company think about when you are, um, you know, before a product is rolled out, you know, you need to think, hey, is this new? Because that's what the CEO is saying. This is new and novel. It's going to take over the world. Did we file a patent? Oh no, I better check. So that's the kind of thing that you need to be doing. Alternatively, if you've got patents that you found in the past, uh, and then suddenly your CEO mentioned in a briefing, you know what, we have all these patents and then people are suddenly starting to use our technology, even though it's, we thought it's obsolete, but it's not because everyone's using it today. Then one thing you might want to consider doing is digging up your old patents because that's where your due diligence comes in. Have a look at stuff that you have um, accumulated over the years and then decide because honestly in the AI world we live in, a lot of old technology is being rehashed and reshaped and being rolled out. So that's something you need to, to, to help your company with, you know, to think about whether or not there's, um, there's, there's old stuff that you can now use to block your competitors um, and even maybe to commercialize for your company. And the other thing you need to think about, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is protection in other countries. So copyright, for example, a lot of our clients are rolling out, you know, software, um, solutions because that's where you know we're developing things here and in some countries in the world copyright is registrable and if you want to enforce the copyright you need to have a registration so for example in the US and in China you know um, most of us here don't really know about this because we don't file for copyright protection here but in other countries it might be so you need to check with your, your IP lawyers or you know think about whether or not that's something you need to be doing in order to protect yourselves in other countries. Okay, next slide. So I'm just gonna move on to um, a case study. And this is a case from a couple of years back here in Singapore. And this affects all of us who do online shopping, right? Um, and Calvin Klein in this case went after this company called HS International Private Limited and uh, involved a sale of products on Taobao. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so there was a Singapore website, sgbuyforyou.com, um, and basically users could purchase a wide variety of products. Products were obtained from Taobao. Um, and uh, the, the facts, actually, what we've done is, is in the next slide. Next slide, please. Right, so I, what we tried to do is expand the, the picture that was there earlier, just to help you see what was going on. So if you look at the extreme left on the slide, shop for Taobao listing. So basically you, the user, would go on Taobao and look for stuff. And what you then did was to submit your order to SG Buy For You. You make your payment to them and then they will sort it out for you. So SG Buy For You, if you go around the, the clock at one o'clock, uh, SG Buy For You will place the order and then the product is sent to SG Buy For You's warehouse in China. So Taobao will ship it to them. Uh, SG Buy For You will then freight the products to Singapore, arrives at the Singapore warehouse, and then they will deliver it to your doorstep. Next slide, please. So, coming clients suspected some of these goods on the SG by for you website to be counterfeit, and they conducted uh, private investigations, got a trap purchase, and search warrant, and then there was a raid at the Singapore warehouse, and Singapore police uh, got involved. Just to pause there, Singapore police has been actually very active for quite a few of our clients because they are familiar with online sales today. So, I mean, this is one example of a case, but obviously there's a lot of sales of uh, dodgy looking products out there today. 
and the Singapore police is pretty proactive. So there's something called the IPRB, the IP rights branch of the police, and they have a team that's actually just looking at you know things on the on the web, and and calling up uh, law firms or the clients directly to say, uh, are you does this look strange to you? You know, sort of a product, you know, a pair of uh, uh, you know um, Gucci shoes. Assuming that happened uh, anyway. Is selling for you know fifty dollars when it should be you know six thousand dollars. Something doesn't look right. They may contact Gucci or Gucci lawyer. Anyway, so in this case, Kelvin Klein commenced action for trademark infringement against Ashi Buy for You. Now, interestingly, and this is quite common, the, the next word Ashi Buy for You denied infringing and said that their business was uh, merely facilitating the sale and purchase of goods. You know, and individual sellers on top our liable instead. So this is what they were saying. Look, it's not me. I, I'm just helping, you know, and the guys that are the real crooks are the guys on top out. The court held that the website operator was liable for infringement because the activities of the SG by field business were not similar to those of customers, customer to customer platforms such as eBay or Amazon. Uh, because SG by for you themselves placed the product orders, they made and received payment, and received and delivered goods. So they their involvement, their role was a lot more than, than what your, your standard eBay and, and Amazon uh, roles were. So in this case, and this is this is a, a good story, I guess, for, for brand owners out there, that where you can show those things in the in the blue bullets at the bottom, uh, then you can get your you know the, the websites. And I think this this case is useful in the in the current world we live in, because a lot of this stuff is going on, and so we need to try and make sure that we can catch. Um, you know, the proofs one way or another. If not, we try and hold the, the websites themselves liable. Uh, next slide, please. So, online strategy, I think that's one of the, the points that I was talking about at the beginning. Um, so, a large number of sales are being made in physical markets, and counterfeits are increasing, and they're increasing in these marketplaces. Um, and so, you've got Shopee. Uh, Bukalapat in, in this is Indonesia, Carousel, TikTok, and even even Instagram and so on. I mean, you see stuff being sold left, right, center, everywhere. And everybody's just sitting at home and clicking on the computer and ordering stuff. And my wife does this, and then the doorbell rings, and then suddenly there's like twenty boxes being delivered. And you know, so this is the world we live in. And I think for all of you, if you're if you're in a company that's making products and and so on, um, you need to be alive on what's going on in all of these platforms. You need to, to be monitoring, you need to have a team of people. Uh, there are a lot of software providers out there that are watching these spaces. And many of our clients have engaged in the services to, to go and, and do all kinds of uh, investigations in this space. Next slide, please. Um, the next slide just gives you an idea of um, the top five. This is back last year. So Shopee is big. Um, Lazada, of course, and, and so on. So those are things that you need to um, be alive to and keep tabs on. Um, next slide, please. And I'm going to finish off just by, by saying that in this space, what do you, what do, you do? How do you, you know, try and make sure that um, you keep the counterfeiters at bay? Well, you need to engage with um, a variety of um, um, you know, bodies here in Singapore. So customs is a good place to start if you haven't already. Engage with customs officials, uh, do trainings, and that's what you know. Uh, either the brands themselves do, or we do for our clients as well. And many lawyers do that. You know, you do trainings. You help them identify pricing, the products. You know, the genuine versus the fake stuff that you've seen out there. Um, and in other countries too. Not so, don't just focus on Singapore. Do this in, in China if you can, or you know, Indonesia and, and other parts of the ASEAN region because this is it's really where it's all happening today. Um, and the good thing about a country like Singapore, you know, things happen fast and we can get um, the counterfeiters quickly and, you know, the, the system allows for quick prosecution and so on and so forth. Um, but do do be mindful for customs, for example, the, the last bullet point there, that uh, there are tight deadlines. So you sometimes have up to only 48 hours to make a decision on what to do next. Uh, and so you need to be prepared, uh, whether you yourself or your external lawyers, to, to deal with this stuff. So in, in the current world we live in, you know, the, the, whether it's AI or I mean, whatever it is, uh, these are things that you need to be on top of 
it's a shift slightly from going to a shop in Sydney Square or something like that and looking for things. This is where it's all happening. And so that's why, you know, I, I think you need to maybe have a rethink internally and, and be on top of things like this. Uh, so that's really all I have. Next slide is my mug shop. Yeah. So I think that's all I have and I'll hand it back to Sharon. Thank you, Anand, for the very enlightening session. I particularly found the case study very interesting. Um, again, for the participants, please, please leave any questions you have for Anand in the Q&A box. So after hearing more about the challenges and some of the creative solutions and things to look out to help us navigate this challenge, changing landscape, our last speaker for this session, Jeffrey, will be sharing on the talent that will be actually needed to execute these solutions. So before I introduce Jeffrey, we have another poll question for you on your perspective of, of AI and talent. Um, so okay, I think it's appeared on your screen now. So how do you think AI will most impact your organization's talent landscape in the next three years? So number one, change in type of talent needed. Two, cultural and mindset shift of workforce. Three, more training and retraining to upskill current workforce. Employees, number four, employees shifting focus to higher value activities. So again, we'll keep the op uh, poll open for the next 20 to 30 seconds. Um, and as we wait for the results of the poll, which Jeffrey will cover shortly, let me also give a quick introduction about him. So Jeffrey is our regional director at Michael Page Singapore. He entered the business in 2007 as a consultant and has had a consistent track record of success growing together with the business he currently leads the Michael Page recruitment business in 10 different disciplines and oversees a team of 40 consultants. Prior to Michael Page, Jeffrey also had relevant industry experience as a qualified chartered accountant. Handing over the time to you now, Jeff. Hi, thanks Sharon for the introduction. Um, looking at the poll results, um, interesting to note that um, more training and retraining uh, to upskill the current force as well as uh, employees shifting to, to high value activities are, are probably what uh, we are seeing right now in the market. And I think both of these points are going to be covered uh, in my slides uh, later today. Uh, first of all, very happy to be given a chance uh, to discuss one of the hottest topics in technology right now, which is artificial intelligence. I'll be sharing some interesting stats, uh, market trends, and how it's impacting the market. And also I'll touch on the legal market for 2020, what we see in terms of recruitment, and candidate outlook. The stats and findings in the next few slides uh, comes from the Michael Page um, Humans of AI Report, which was launched earlier in July. Moving on to AI. Now, based on research from various articles, uh, most companies understand the importance of AI and has already set in place clear plans and strategies on how to incorporate AI into their day-to-day -day operations. Now, I think it's fair to say that um, AI is part of daily life and one of the most popular users of AI is in the areas of customer service and customer experience. For example, German car maker Porsche invested heavily into a centralized uh, CRM data center that documents every interaction throughout the customer life cycle. By better understanding the psyche and expectation of their customers, this will allow them to drive more effective uh, marketing campaigns and which will in turn result in an increase in customer conversion rate for them. Now, in another AI report from PricewaterhouseCoopers, 72% of business leaders globally believe that AI will be the business advantage of the future, as it has the potential to optimize processes and increase productivity across organizations. The same report also states that 80% of the consumers they surveyed feel it's more important having access to affordable legal advice than to preserve the jobs of lawyers. Now, maybe this shows that there might be interesting changes coming in the legal profession as AI becomes even more widely adopted in the market. Moving on, um, I think the key challenges uh, facing companies right now uh, is the lack of talent in the market. Based on LinkedIn 2020 Emerging Jobs Report for Singapore, um, AI specialists and robotic engineers are the top two jobs in demand. To combat these shortages, our government, through the National Research Foundation, has launched AI Singapore, which is a national AI program focusing on deep research in this field, as well as investing and growing the local talent pool in AI. So hopefully, in the not so distant future, this will help in closing the talent shortage in AI. 
Now move on to some of the top AI, AI trends and innovations. Um, we spoke with top AI leaders across APEC, and, and these are some of the key points uh, to highlight. Segmentation of job types will happen as AI matures over time. Roles will become more defined, especially at the higher level, while lower final jobs will be open for blue collar workers to fill as well. I think this sort of explains um, the earlier step that you no know, job creation from AI will outweigh the loss of jobs. At the same time, we also require AI talents to have cross disciplinary knowledge and have broader business commercial skills that operate outside of their tech domain. For example, they are expected to be problem solvers within their organizations. And in order to do that, they need to develop a stronger understanding of their industry, its challenges and opportunities. Now leaders have to adopt a more personalized management approach to unblock the potential of their team. They need to prioritize hiring plans, resources, and management according to market needs. So basically they need to think big, start small, and then look to scale up really fast. Building an ecosystem to nurture and retain talent is key. It's already very hard to find great AI talent, so keeping them motivated and engaged is very important. Besides offering better salaries and benefits, companies need to think of ways to create a conducive environment for talent to grow. Talent development initiatives such as having programs to continuously develop them in their skill sets and broaden their mindset will enable them to reap the benefits of AI talent staying for the long term. A change of mindset is needed to succeed in the AI game. AI is like a long-term investment and journey for most companies. The more data you gather, the greater the talent you hire and the stronger value of AI. A lot of companies fail because they, they invest in AI half-heartedly and expect to see results immediately. Moving on, we are looking at new job types in the legal market. I think we are seeing some interesting changes in the kind of legal jobs right now. We start off with legal technologies and these are legal professionals with a high degree of competency in technology and are using it to gain competitive advantage. Now tasks can vary from legal project management to using machine learning software to work with client data and bypass manual documentation. This can result in huge time and cost savings. Now legal AI platform trainers and consultants are also needed with the emergence of legal technologies. We are seeing companies investing more on trainers and consultants to upskill their legal teams. Legal designers looks at how to simplify law for the end users and consumers. For example, legal contracts can sometimes be too long and difficult for one to read and understand. So a legal designer can step in to make the contract more engaging, visual, and easier to understand. Technology is key here. Now using smart tools to analyze data and then customize the solution for their clients. Besides tech driven changes in the legal market, we are also seeing an increase in patent experts in the region. I think this ties in um, nicely what Anna has said earlier, which explains about you know, patents and how it's being impacted in the different markets in, in Asia PAC. Now, global patent filing showed exponential growth of 72.3% in the last 10 years. Now, in 2018, that's about 3.3 million applications. In China alone, they account for about 1.5 million patent applications. Now, their duties range from prosecution and filing works to enforcement and impeachment. Now we'll take a short break and run a second poll to understand how legal teams will look like in 2021. I'll give you guys about 20, 30 seconds to input your response before we start on with the next slide. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, so you guys will all see the poll come up on screen right now. So the question is, how do you think in-house legal teams will look like in 2021. We ask that you please choose the top two answers. Um, the first choice is lean in-house teams with, inc with increased use. And a second one is expansion of in-house teams to, sorry, not able to see the full, the full options because of, of my screen, but I'm sure you'll be able to see that on your screen. Um, so we have about six options in total. So if you can just choose the top two and submit your answers, we can share um, the answers shortly. Jeff, what is your prediction on what would be the top response? Well, um, these are all very, very relevant uh, answers to, to what we're seeing right now, but um, I think we are seeing um, definitely more responsibilities coming in for in-house teams to take on uh, as, as they need to cover wider jurisdiction. 
for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, uh, with the current difficult market conditions, um, I think uh, further right-sizing of legal teams is, is needed for some companies. But again, I, I don't want to sway the response too much. So I, I'd like the, the participants uh, input their, their, their answers in there. Yep. Okay. So we'll give about 10 more seconds to those of you who haven't voted, and then we will close the, the poll shortly to see if Jeff's prediction is right. All right. Um, thanks so much for joining us on this poll. We'll end it now and then share the results. And here you go, Jeff, you're pretty spot on. Oh. <laughs> like <it. laughs> I, I hope I did not influence um, the audience with, with, with my response, but, but it's clear that um, you know, in-house teams have to be more uh, multidimensional right now you know, to take on more and more uh, in their current scope. And, and of course, nowadays we are living uh, in, a, in a very different and, and difficult uh, market. So uh, our companies are looking at uh, cost cutting and, and, and budget constraints. So uh, right-sizing of legal teams um, seems to be uh, one of the approach for that. Right, so um, moving with that in mind, uh, I'll move on to my next uh, slide and present. Now I'll touch on the, the trends for legal market in Singapore. Um, the good news is Singapore continues to be a great place for global regional hubs. Now some recent examples uh, in news where we all seen is the likes of Tencent and ByteDance setting up uh, regional headquarters in Singapore. I think it's clear that the geopolitical landscape plus a, a strong and vibrant pool of talent makes it an attractive location for companies to relocate or set up their headquarters here. There's also an increasing importance of legal professionals to partner the business. Companies, rather than relying everything on external law firms, um, are starting to bring legal functions internally by hiring general or legal counsels, getting them involved in high-level strategic planning and commercial decisions. Now, I explained earlier, there is a growing trend where talent with broad, diverse skill sets are in demand. They are able to add value to the company by playing different key roles in the business. Data privacy talents continue to be in, in demand due to increase in data privacy regulation, enforcement, and awareness. I think that was obviously covered by Jeremy er, earlier in his uh, presentation. Definitely, we see also see a high demand for talent within deep knowledge in cybersecurity and personal data protection field. The technology fintech, FS, and renewable energy sectors are still growing relatively well. And besides hiring illegal uh, functions, we see them hiring in other functional areas as well. Now, the last point is about companies being more cautious in hiring. Now, while new jobs dropped by 20%, uh, this is not uh, new, I would say, uh, the number of interviews per job year on year went up by 41%. Now, based on these figures, we can see that clients are definitely much more selective in their hiring this year and will meet more candidates before and then find the right one. Moving on, I'll touch on what employers look for in candidates. Now, digital literacy obviously is important as companies are relying more on technology, um, not just to compete, but also to survive. So candidates are able to make the best use of available technology and social media will stand out amongst the crowd. Innovative thinking and problem solving, solving skills are important right now. Companies will prefer candidates who can think out of the box and constantly try new solutions to improve and develop themselves further. The legal design role is a good example of this the ability to simplify tedious issues and present a tailored solution to end users. A growth mindset and broad skill set is needed as companies want someone who can connect the dots and look at the big picture. As explained earlier, we see technology candidates not just focusing on their respective domain, but also have the commercial acumen to understand the industry which their business operates. Similarly, within the legal field, we see professionals who are very competent in using technology to achieve high efficiency and productivity. And obviously candidates with multilingual skills are gaining traction as legal teams look at a regional, if not global scope. And obviously they need to work closely with stakeholders across different markets and jurisdictions. For example, uh, the, the example of Tencent and ByteDance setting up their operations here, we see more and more Chinese companies looking to, to base offices in Singapore. So there has been an increase in demand for Chinese speaking lawyers to effectively manage global stakeholders and contract management. Moving on, I'll touch on uh, legal candidates uh, and, and what we see in the market this year. Now, on one hand, while we see that companies are more careful in their hiring process, candidates are also more careful in switching careers. Now, if you have a stable trial record with a current company, you might not want to move and rebuild your credibility and relationship from scratch. Now, that being said, uh, we see more candidates being active, 
um, this year went up by about 71.4%. Why is that so? Now, obviously, there are candidates who are immediately available in the market after being made redundant by, by their previous employers. Also, we see candidates looking out because there's a lack of growth and development in their current organization. So they want to explore better opportunities right now. With regards to salary increment, it's still at a healthy rate of 15%, but it's a drop of about 9% from 2019. I must say that uh, for the legal profession, this is still much better than a lot of other job functions in the market. Moving on, we touch on what tenants are looking for right now. Growth. I think that's uh, explained previously, tenants are looking at beyond the monetary aspects and focusing on growth and development. They'll look at the growth of the company, personal development, and they want to see themselves growing and taking on more responsibilities in the future. Candidates want to take on, obviously, a, mod, a much broader role uh, right now. You know, they, they prefer roles with broader scopes than a specialized one. They want to be involved in more decision-making process and work with a wider range of stakeholders within the company. Flexibility, right now in COVID, I think has challenged us to work and live in new ways. As more and more professionals feel that they can be more productive, working remotely rather than in office, we see companies such as Facebook, Microsoft, Google, allowing their employees to work from home indefinitely. Stability. Now, with a volatile and uncertain market, candidates are now wary of making the wrong move. So they want to seek long-term stability in their next role. So companies and sectors that have demonstrated this will have a competitive advantage in pitching to candidates. Culture. Now, that's always one of the most uh, important things that candidates are looking for. They want to look for the right fit in the market. They want to know whether the company shares the same value system and beliefs as them. This will then allow them to grow organically and stay for the long term. Now, I'll end off with a, a quick conclusion, um, a quote from an article from Law Technology Today, where it states that uh, impact of lawyers, AI on lawyers. Now, it's an interesting article where it highlights the advancement of AI and machine learning, how we will not automate lawyers out of existence, but rather enable them to take on more complex, high value work for our clients. Now, thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you, Jeffrey, for sharing with us more about the talent for AI and also more about the legal market in Singapore. So finally, we've come to the Q&A section. Uh, I think we have many good questions in the Q&A box, as you can see. So we'll try to answer as many of them, if not all, in the remaining time. So just to remind the participants, you can also indicate a thumbs up beside the question that other participants have raised, if it's something that you're also interested to find out more about as well. All right, so um, just to start the Q&A, um, the, most, the most popular question, I think this is, this is probably for Jeremy, what are the gaps between the existing privacy laws and the dynamics of AI? What are the practical solutions that you can plug those gaps? Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sharon. So I think this is a, this is a very interesting question. Um, and I think, I think the issue is, is not so much about the dynamic nature of AI, but it's really understanding what we're talking about when we, when we say AI. And this goes back to the concept of you know, privacy by design, by really making sure that you understand what you are trying to achieve with the artificial intelligence. So the laws, I think, will, will, will always be playing catch up to technology change. But I think the practical solution to making sure that the technology that we're talking about can align with the privacy laws is really having a good understanding of the artificial intelligence, understand what sort of data you are collecting, where is that data coming from, how is that data being collected, why do you need that data? I think, you know, as Law is asking these very basic questions actually gives you a good understanding of the technology and then you can um, you know, advise the business or advise your internal clients or your clients on a very, you know, informed basis. I think once you have an answer to those questions, then, then you can map them back to the principles of most privacy laws, which is, you know, making sure that you've had the right consent when you've collected the um, data, making sure that the consent was actually broad enough to co contemplate the use of artificial intelligence, um, making sure that you have addressed any cross-border transfer requirements, um, and also making sure that you have the right security mechanisms in place as well to secure the data that you're collecting. So, so, so in, in summary, I think the, the, the practical solution, the, 
plugging the gaps. It's really in understanding the, the, the AI that we're talking about and asking those very basic questions of like what, why, how, you, you know, just so that you can apply the law in, in those contexts. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks for that. Um, so the next question that we have is for Anand. So what is the future of trade secrets as a valid form of IP protection in the AI space? There's a trend globally towards increasing transparency and explainability requirements for AI systems, especially for black box applications in the healthcare space. Isn't that threat a threat? Sorry, isn't that trend a threat if once AI IP asset is a trade secret? Okay, wow, loaded question. I mean, it's, <laughs> um, I think at the end of the day, if things need to be disclosed because of rules and regulations and because of safety issues, then, then they have to be disclosed. If they have to be disclosed, then your patent filings and, and other IP protections are the way to go. You know, so if you know that you won't be able to keep stuff secret because the regulators will demand a disclosure, then obviously you need to do the next best thing and then do your patent filing or whatever it is. But there are still there is still room for the traditional um, trade secret uh, protection. And I think there was another question later on about trade secrets and um, and balancing it. Uh, ultimately, you know, trade secrets are still are still um, things that a lot of, depending on the industry you're in, some industry players really die die don't want to share with other people, you know, and so they will still do what they can uh, to keep those as trade secrets. But maybe you're right in this particular sector that we're talking about, the AI industry, because things are moving fast, um, it may be harder. Um, but I think there is still some room for for some of these things, but. The, the flip side, of course, is to keep something as a trade secret means you really got to keep it secret, you know. And so if you need to share it with, you know, but the, I, there's no fixed number, but more than five people, more than 10, more than 20, 100 people, then you're going to have difficulties then labeling that as a trade secret because it's just so much more difficult to, to keep secret. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, with, with hackers, you know, from whichever country you want, you just name a country in this one. Um, it's going to be harder also to keep things as trade secrets unless you really have super solid guys managing, you know, your, your vault, let's say. Okay, thank you, Adam, for that. Um, so, let's see. Uh, for the third question, we've got, I think that's for Jeff. That's also a very popular question. So, the question is, what are the main challenges you might foresee in hiring the best talent for our organizations? Oh, thanks, Sean, uh, for, for that question. Um, obviously, there's many challenges that we see right now um, in, in hiring the, the best talent or the right talent for your, for your company. I think the, the most critical one is uh, we see a, a disjoint uh, between client and candidate expectation. Um, in terms of the talent pool, uh, the largest demand is actually in the five to eight years TQE range today. While the majority of our candidates right now, uh, they're either very senior with more than 12 years of TQE or they have less than three years of PQE. So, so clearly, um, we lack a, a talent pool between the, the five to eight years PQE range today. And, and even though uh, the, the market might seem to be relatively uh, unstable, but the really good candidates are very passive right now. So they would ask, ask for above market rate increment to move in, in, in these current times. But of course, companies, when you're facing uh, budget, budget constraints, you might not be able to, to offer, a, say, a 20% or 25% uh, increment to them. And, and because our uh, companies are, are more careful about hiring right now, uh, they want the perfect candidate. You know, they, they don't want to train candidates from scratch. So they are looking for candidates with the right industry experience. They, are, they want candidates with, with every skill set that's tick in the box. But at the same time, uh, these candidates are not so keen to move because if I have the, the perfect skill set, you know, I want to go for the next job. I want to grow in the next role. So clearly, you know, this is, this is how we see, uh, you know, the market right now where clients and candidates seem to have a bit of mismatch in expectations. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. So I think the next question that we have is probably for all the speakers. So maybe I will have Jeremy to start first and then the rest of the speakers can chime in. 
Um, so the question is, where do we see our market in the adoption of AI? And what is needed to switch internally for the shift in mindset? Thank you very much, Sharon. So I, I think if, if we're looking at our market as the, the legal market, um, then I think that there's still quite a long way to go in terms of the adoption of AI. I think we are making progress. Um, we are starting to see you know, clients and in-house counsels requiring us to use legal technology, um, which has actually put us in a very good place as a technology-focused firm. So Bert, Bert has a client solutions team, which actually makes quite uh, which has a wide array of uh, artificial intelligence and 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 and, and um, legal automation tools that allow us to serve our clients um, in this space to meet the demand. So I think we're starting to see um, an adoption of artificial intelligence, but probably not as steep an adoption as we would like or as we would anticipate. And I think a lot of that is really due to as the question rightly rightly identified, it's a mindset shift. Um, and I think what what has helped in in the past, and in, in my experience when I've worked with clients and using artificial intelligence tools, is to start small, start with a small project. You know, look at how, for example, an artificial intelligence tool could be used to speed up the due diligence process for an acquisition. Um, get the get the get the, in, the the clients comfortable with the use of um, of artificial intelligence, help them understand that the margin of error um, from an artificial intelligence program is probably not too far off from a very fatigued and very tired person who's doing a, a monotonous task as well. So I think it's, it's, it's making sure that, you know, start small, help the clients or the business understand that there is, there is, um, there is, uh, the, the, the risk from using AI isn't that significant, um, and then make sure that there is a human layer on top of it for now to make sure that there is that human check or that final check. To, that, but that, that, that human check doesn't duplicate the work that's being done by the AI, but it's just a check and a control. And I think, you know, with these small steps, you can really start to change the mindset of the organization and the, and the business team and, and, the, and the in-house counsel's team as well. Um, so I'm just going to pause then and, and let Anna or, or Jeff chime in. Maybe I just add on to, to what Jeremy said. I think when we run the, the Humans of AI report and we interviewed uh, the top um, CIOs or CTOs uh, in, in, in APEC, I, I think, I mean, for, for those who, who feel that um, uh, they have very high success, uh, AI adoption rates are those with very solid um, backing from, from all the C-level uh, in the company. I think, I think once the, the top management has a very clear plan and strategy you know, to drive um, AI across the different functions and across different markets, I think I think you can see a consistency in 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 in, in how you know um, the subordinates and management team can can roll this out, and, and, and obviously conversely, if if um, if they don't have a, a consistent message across the different uh, functions and, and different teams, then um, more often than not, uh, you don't see the right results and you don't see the right ROI coming back to the company. So so I think that feedback from from the CIOs across APEC, I think that was quite helpful for us. Um, okay, so IP, a colleague of mine from the UK wrote an article saying, who owns an IP generated invention? And you know, only in today's world do we have this kind of strange question that we have to ask ourselves, right? Who owns IP generated IP, basically, uh, AI generated IP? And that's what we're facing. And that's, I guess, for all of you who are in house, that's the kind of things you all need to be thinking about with your management when it comes to IP filings, right? Do you need to file new IP protection for certain things that you have? Do you need to make sure your data is up to date so that you can prove ownership? Uh, and so it's a whole new world out there and it's a whole new series of things you need to be not only filing, but also making sure that nobody else has filed because everybody else is in on this and, and filing all kinds of new IP covering this space. So you need to you know, stay uh, with the curve, ahead of the curve, whatever it is, but you, you need to, you really need, we all need a different mindset. You know, the company I used to work for uh, is also facing this kind of challenge. Now having to move forward and think about the IP protection that we need to be looking out for. I mean, th there's still questions. So if, if a robot um, generates IP, which, which does happen today, currently the law is that the owner of the robot enjoys IP ownership. Whether that's going to be the case in six months, 12 months and beyond, who knows, but also keep, 
up to date on, on all these legal developments because interesting stuff is going on in other countries, in America and in parts of Europe. So it's really trying to be on top of all these developments. Thank you all for that. Sorry, I think if I, if oh, sorry, I was just going to, I was just going to, I was just going to um, chime in and say that I think, I think that Anand and, and Jeff have both touched on very pertinent points and, and pulling it all together. I think in, in my experience, I've seen AI being very successful in an organization where it is started off as a small, you know, in the, on a small scale project as a starter, almost like a pilot, but that has bought and C-suite buy-in, uh, but that has also done an objective analysis, both not just from a, a, a ROI or cost benefit analysis, but also from a legal risk perspective, looking at, looking at, uh, looking at it holistically and saying, look, these are the, these are the data issues that we need to look at, but these are the data benefits that we can gain. These are the IP issues that we should be aware of. Um, but then these are the cost savings that we would get, and these are the benefits that we get, and all of these being floated up to the board, and then running the pilot, and then publicizing the public, the pilot within the organization, making sure that people understand that, that you know that this is a successful model and that it can work. And I think that that has, you know, done wonders for the adoption of artificial intelligence within organizations. Thank you very much, Jeremy, Jeffrey, and Anand. I think it's quite interesting to hear it from uh, three very different perspectives and putting it all together. Uh, so thanks for that. So I think the next question is probably for both uh, Jeremy and Anand. Um, for startup data companies, what are the five most important things for Pioneer in-house legal counsel for the company to do in creating legal SOPs, policies, and controls to achieve tangible legal efficiency? This is like a free advice. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so, so if you look at my first bullet point for today, and that's that's your IP audit. Uh, if you don't have any IP, then obviously your audit is zero. But then you need to start thinking about creating IP. I think for, for young, new companies, your IP creation is very important because investors basically love to see a long list of things, right? Whether it's, even if it's trademarks, but ideally patterns, those are the, the sexy IP that people like to see. Um, you know, if you haven't already got it, go and get something filed so that you look a little more impressive, you know. Um, and, you know, if you've got stuff, take hold of it, or if you're merging with somebody, or, you know, there's, there's relationships that you've, you've created with, uh, you know, other companies around you, pull all your stuff together and make sure you start you know, padding it up, making sure it looks more impressive. Because anyway, from the IP perspective, that's really important. And the other four points will be handled by Jeremy, of course. Uh, <laughs> and that's why I was thinking I should go first, because then I could just deal with one and leave the four for Anand. Um, but, but jokes aside, I think just, just picking up on what Anand mentioned about having the audit and having the right policies and procedures in, in place, I think that, that that's quite an interesting insight, because you know, in, in, I would say in the past five or seven years, we started to see at the due diligence stage um, where investors are looking to invest into companies, we're starting to see a greater emphasis on um, IP portfolios, data portfolio, data compliance as well. And this is, you know, from a data perspective, this commensurate with the global increase in fines for contravention of data, data privacy laws. And investors are starting to say, hey, I don't want to take on a company that has you know a leaky data privacy approach because uh, whilst data is the DNA or data processing is the DNA and the beyond and all of that company or is what that company stands for, it could also bring um, a huge risk for me uh, because I could be saddled with a fine. And you see in the new um, amendments to the PDPA that are going to come up, we are moving to a, uh, an annual turnover type of fine. A percentage of an annual turnover type of fund, similar to what's happening in Europe with the GDPR. So I think this is starting to weigh on investors' minds as well. I think you know traditionally it's always been you know the the corporate aspects of it, the reps and warrants and all that kind of stuff. But I think now is the, the the due diligence on data and data compliance has started to become a bit more uh, important for investors. So on that point, I think it's really you know making sure that you have the right policies and procedures in place, but also understanding your data risk. You know, where are you collecting your data from? Who are you collecting from? And how are you going to apply that? I think that's very important. 
um, and, and then making sure that those risks are adequately addressed through your policies, through your terms and conditions. Um, and, and, and then I think filtering that down within the organization, I think is important because if you are a small company, um, you will probably be a very small legal team, but then that, but so it also means that it's more important that the organization understands the legal risk that come with non-compliance and data protection laws, because you as a one or two man show may not be able to do everything. Um, and you're dependent on your on on the employees within your organization. So I think you know understanding that risk, making sure that you have the right policies and procedures in place, and then educating the the, the employees, educating your colleagues, and making sure that they understand um, privacy and turning them in, in in some way to an advocate for privacy within the organization as well. Educate the sales team that you know if they are selling something, they need to be mindful of these privacy obligations, or the the research team as well that when they're creating new products they need to be mindful of these things because you cannot be everywhere and and, and watching and looking over everybody's shoulders uh, much as us lawyers like to do that we have a control a uh, need to control um, but i think you know you need to change the mindset within the organization and it's and it's it's a little bit easier when you're a startup when you are young and you, you can build that into the culture of the company i think it's a little bit harder when you're trying to sort of reverse engineer that into a bigger organization that's been entrenched in a particular way of doing things. So that, I, that, that's not four points, but sort of one big point <laughs> lumped together. Hopefully it makes I, up I for just, the lack of numbers. No, no, I think I'll just add to what you said. I think those, those are very good points. Uh, and just one, one thing to add on is as a company grows though, you need to have some level of flexibility. So I think you also want to start to project, you know, if you start small, 10 people, 20 people, and then you, you know, look at, look at Lazada, look at Grab, you know, they've grown to giants, right? And, you know, they started small. And I think you also have to prepare for the upscaling of your company with investment, money coming in and growing. Then in terms of whatever policies you put into place, I think you also need to then be prepared to adjust those and communicate those same things, as Jeremy's mentioned to everybody because okay you know, now that we've reached this stage okay now these are the changes that we're going to start to implement or we're going to approach things differently you know the way we monitor this monitor that keep this and collect data and, and, and do our ip protection and so on and so forth so, so just that as well yeah I, I think sorry just to just to add on maybe i do have one more point in addition to my big point is that i think i think another, another important part about changing the mindset um, as, as, as a legal counsel is that what you're trying to do is show value to the organization. And, and in this day and age, with more and more people becoming aware of data privacy rights, um, with, the, with the widespread blasting that all of us got with the advent of GDPR, more and more people are aware of data privacy rights, data protection rights, data subject rights. And having these policies and controls that you put in place internally, you should then think about how you can turn that into marketing material show your clients that you are compliant because that is a very powerful marketing tool in the day and age where people are saying what's what's this company doing with my data well if you're telling them if you're being transparent with how the, you are using their data i think that that will help in turn sell your product sell your company sell your services to them so i think it's a, it's a little bit of a pivot in the mindset as well but and it sort of shifts the legal counter to not just being a cost center in the, in the sort of traditional perspective, but also into a, into a revenue center because you're helping to sell more of your company's products and services by evidencing that your products and services are compliant with the data privacy laws. Thank you both. Uh, I think that's very practical and very good advice. I think you can both charge for that. <laughs> anyway, okay, so let uh, Anand and Jeremy take a break. Uh, the next question is for Jeffrey. So are there any specific areas where you see a gap in the Singapore market between the legal talent available versus what is being sought? Um, and what is the outlook of filling that gap from foreign lawyers coming from outside of Singapore? Yeah, I, I think this question is uh, somewhat similar to the other question we answered, right? So I think at, at, at the broad level, um, candidates with about five to eight years of uh, post-qualified experience, I think uh, we see a shortage of talent there. Uh, clearly, um, uh, the pool of talent within the space is, is, is not very, very strong. So uh, companies, they are all looking at, at this pool of talent, and as a result, there might be a slight talent war there within the space. Um, and, and then I think that's what, um, what I see at, at a broad base level. Of course, 
within the specific um, um, technical uh, functions of legal, um, um, for sure, you know, there will be certain niche areas that uh, companies are looking at. For example, if you want someone with uh, the linguistic ability to speak in a perfect Mandarin, business Mandarin, then that, that poses another challenge for us. Or if one candidate to be from the specific industry as well, then again, um, it, it will be a challenge because then the pool gets even, even um, um, smaller in, in the market. And, and to the second part of the question, which is um, looking at um, foreign lawyers coming to Singapore to fill the gap, um, I think it depends on the preference of clients. And unfortunately, I would say most of our clients do have a, a preference for Kansas ones coming based here uh, right now. Um, so they will give um, these candidates the, 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 the first choice or the first preference. Of course, if you can't find the right uh, people from, from, from local candidate uh, pool, then we do advise our clients to be more open to candidates from, from other countries when they come to Singapore. But I, I think that will probably be more of a secondary uh, approach and, and priority for them. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, so maybe you just can take one more question before we go back to Anand and uh, Jeremy. So I think one of the questions was given legal and compliance are key hot markets for hiring, what attributed to the reduction in the salary range? Actually, I'm not, not sure I get the question right. Uh, if you're referring to my slide, um, what I meant is when candidates move in the market, they are, they are getting about 15% um, for legal professionals. So that's still quite a healthy uh, increment uh, right now. Uh, but of course, if you compare with 2019, where it's about 17 to 18%, um, that's a slight drop uh, for sure, but that's probably attrib attributable to, to the current market conditions, right? Um, so yes, I agree that the legal compliance are, are still pretty hot and still in demand. Um, salaries are not going to reduce, for sure. I mean, people are not moving for, for a reduction of package. Um, they will be asking for at least a 15% increase right now. Sorry, I was muted. So I think I can also chime in a bit there. So while I think legal and compliance are very important jobs in uh, companies, but because um, when we look at in-house, right, in the, the in-house in space, legal and compliance at the end of the day are still um, kind of support functions. So given the current climate where I think organizations are looking at, you know, how they can um, look for more revenue, it's not, a, it's not exactly a, a position where um, there, there is a lot of demand at the moment. So I think even speaking to our colleagues in the financial services space, um, for risk and compliance, they've seen a, a, a drop this year. Uh, whereas if they're looking at like front office roles, um, that's actually still ongoing. Yeah, so, so I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, Sharon, so... Sharon, I think there's another question, I think below where um, there's a hiring manager looking what to look out for, right? Maybe I can just answer that as well. Okay, quickly. yeah. Please. I think the simple, the simple answer is to look for Sharon, of course. I mean, she, <laughs> she, she is an expert within the, the Singapore legal of professional market. So if you're looking to hire, um, please look for, for Sharon Go. I mean, her, her contact details will be shared later on today. <laughs> but, <laughs> but of course, uh, on, a, on a more serious note, um, uh, I, I think I'm, I mentioned earlier about expectation. I think that's, that's very important. If you're looking for uh, the best candidate, sometimes that's not what your company needs, right? You need to find someone with the right fit. I, I think that, 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 that's key. Instead of focusing 100% on the technical skills, focus on the soft skills, focus on attitude, focus on potential. I think in focus on someone who can do the job maybe 70, 80% of the time and let the person scale up and, and grow with the company. That's always how you feel the, the best approach uh, right now. Mm, yeah, and I think um, probably there's a bit of misunderstanding there also because um, I would say that there are more legal candidates looking out at the moment but I think when we're talking about the best legal candidates sometimes it's also a bit difficult to attract them because they look at I mean they all want to join the Googles and the Amazons of the world but obviously there, there are only that many positions so I think um, finding somebody with the right organizational fit skill set fit um, and perhaps somebody you think that you can probably skill them up and train them would be most important. And I think the last thing is also, I think that throughout the entire interview process, um, um, I think the candidate experience is also very important. So usually when candidates enjoy the, the interview process, um, uh, the chats with the hiring managers or different stakeholders, it's also a higher possibility that at the end of the process, they will be very happy to accept the offer. Yeah, so I hope that answers. 
Okay, so now back to Jeremy and Anand. <laughs> so for companies which use processes who, who themselves use AI, what advice would you give in terms of getting the due diligence right? Maybe, maybe we can get um, Anand to start first. Sorry, what was the question? Let me read it. Sorry, let me repeat the question. For companies which use processes who themselves use AI, what advice would you give in terms of getting the due diligence right? So I think they, they use third party companies who use AIs. Right. Well, your, obviously your legal documentation must be spot on, right? So that whatever protection, whatever you're giving them, whatever they're creating for you, you know, the ownership has to be identified so that um, whatever is created belongs to you or them or jointly owned. I mean, those things need to be sorted out in advance. And uh, if you are going to be the owner, if you're paying somebody to do things for you, then make sure that person assigns all the IP rights over to you because that's very important. Sometimes people forget, they assume, and then, well, don't assume. Um, and, you know, so, so get your legal documents in order. Go and see a lawyer if you need to, to get, get all this tightened up. Uh, and then also make sure you have the right to go and, and file the IP rights subsequently and that you have full ownership, etc. Uh, more important than that is the ability to get the assistance of the creator. So let's say you outsource it and so on. Um, to help with the IP prosecution down the road. And a good example is a patent, right? So let's say you, you engage a third party to help with certain you know, um, you know, steps of invention, uh, and then eventually it's assigned to you. The, the guys that created it may need to help you later on when you prosecute the patent application or what have you. So, so things like that are important for, for, for you to, to get in place beforehand. Jeremy? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to give a very lawyer's answer to this, and I think it depends. Um, so it really depends on how you are, how the processor, how you are engaging that processor with, uh, who's using AI. If you are using, if you are engaging that processor as a, um, you know, as a um, platform as a service or software as a service for your, for the use of AI, then I think you need to think about the traditional things like service level availability, um, how dependent are you on this AI and what happens if the AI goes down? How would that impact your business? Um, if, it, if, it's, if, if the processor, in the true sense of the processor is using AI to process data uh, on your behalf, then is that, is that your personal data? Um, and what contractual mechanisms have you put in place to ensure that that processor will use the data only as you have instructed? Um, it to use it and in keeping with your obligations under the data protection laws, because I think it's really important to remember that outsourcing of a process doesn't mean outsourcing of responsibility or liability. So you as the principal, for lack of a better word, will still be on the hook for compliance, for your compliance obligations. Um, so as I said, it's really making sure that you have the right contract document in place. Um, making sure that you have the right things like service levels, like um, um, reps and warrants that are specific to the use of data and to, to the use of artificial intelligence, disclaimers, indemnities, uh, liabilities, all the traditional things that we would typically, uh, we as lawyers would typically put into a, a services contract or not so this, this contract, I think we, 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 you would find in, in one of these documents, the, I, the, the game changer is really understanding how the AI is deployed by the processor, what sort of data you're giving to them, and then you can customize those contractual mechanisms to be fit for purpose. So again, it really depends. Sorry, thank you both. Uh, I think we have come to the end of the session. I know we have a couple more questions. Um, so what we'll try to do is to reach out to um, those who have posted questions and see whether we can we can help with those. Um, at the same time, if you have any other questions for us, you can also find our contact details on screen. You can also connect with us by scanning the QR code that you see on screen. Right after this session, you will also be directed to a webinar feedback. 
So if you can just uh, complete it so that we know how you felt about the webinar, that would be great. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you, all the panelists, for your, for in, your invaluable sharing. And we hope to see everyone again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.